Would you open your Bible, please, with me to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. There are several phrases that over the years seem to be used, right? If someone says, that person gave 110%. Why, that's a communication, is it not? That that person really went above and beyond. I mean, if a person gives 100%, that's tremendous. But 110%, well, that's really going above and beyond, isn't it? Or this phrase. Well, you can wait. But it won't be till the cows come home. Right? What does that communicate? It communicates, indeed, an extended period of time. One that goes quite way back, in fact, over the centuries, is this one. I'm fit as a fiddle. Fit as a fiddle. Actually, that went back to the emphasis with regard to violins, of keeping them in really good shape so that they would sound excellent. So when someone says, I'm fit as a fiddle, why, it's in excellence in terms of how you're feeling. Or this one. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, what does that communicate? Helps us understand that as you take in everything, as you consider everything, here comes the summary statement. At the end of the day, here's the heart of everything. Here's the crux of the matter. Our text for today is a at the end of the day text because it gets at the heart of the matter. It gets at the crux of things. In order for us to understand this text, I believe we have to understand the backdrop to it. In ancient day, there was a group of individuals called sophists. S-O-P-H-I-S-T-S. The sophist would go around from community to community. And when they would walk into a town, a, a crowd would gather. And what the crowd liked to do is they liked to ask the sophists a question. They would, they would throw out a topic to hear what the sophists would have to say. The topic could be, politics, it could be philosophy, it could be relationships, it could be just fill in the blank. And what the people loved to hear was how the sophist could could string together these eloquent sentences, seemingly just elevating language to a higher plane. They were enamored, really not so much in the answer. They were enamored in how the answer was given. They were impressed with a sophist's ability to use rhetorical technique to communicate the message. The Apostle Paul says, you've got the sophists here, I'm here. In fact, verse 1 of our text, he's making a distinction between himself and the sophists. Look at it with me, would you please? Chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. Paul writes, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, Paul says, in other words, when when I'm proclaiming to you the mysteries of God, or, or another word is the testimony of God, when I'm proclaiming that to you, I'm not like how the sophists do it. They talk with a flowery language, and everyone oohs and ahs, and when they go home, they don't really remember what the sophist says, but they certainly remember how the sophist said it. Paul says, I got the sophists here. I'm not one of the sophists. In fact, Paul, by his own admission, admits that he wasn't the best of all speakers. Look at chapter 1, 
verse 17 of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1 of verse 17. Paul writes this. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. Paul understood that no one is converted by the eloquence of the speaker, but it is the power of the Holy Spirit using the words of God to convert. Paul was highlighting the fact that, well, you could be impressed with the sophists and all of their eloquent wisdom. Paul says, that's not me. It's not me. Look how else the assessment of his speaking. It's 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. Paul says this about himself. He says, I may be untrained in speech, but not in knowledge. By the time he was 21, the apostle Paul had the equivalent of two PhDs. But notice what he says about his speech. I may be untrained in speech. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, says this about the Apostle Paul. His letters are weighty, but his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is contemptible. What an amazing assessment that is, right? This is the one that God uses to write the majority of the New Testament. And the Apostle Paul, by his own admission here, and by the affirmation of others, says, I'm not really very good at speaking. I'm not really very good at it. Verse 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Got the sophists talking about all kinds of subjects and all kinds of things in their eloquent language. Paul says, I'm not, I'm not very good speaking. You know that. But this is what I've decided to communicate. The cross of Jesus Christ. In fact, he says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Did Paul teach the whole counsel of God? Well, certainly he did. Acts, the 20th chapter, Paul says, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Acts 18, the scripture says of Paul, he stayed there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So when Paul says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified that's hyperbole isn't it that's an exaggeration to make make a point and what's the point that the focus for Paul the focus for Paul was the cross when all was said and done at the end of the day for Paul it was the cross of Christ that was the focus. The word crucial and the word cross comes from the same Latin word, crux. The crux of the matter. You see, for Paul, the crux was the cross. Or another way to put it, the crux was the crux, right? Think of the story of the chapel over in England. A little chapel in a, in a village. It was really quite beautiful. It was made of all these stones and uh, it was quite lovely. And over the entrance of the chapel, the founders wrote these words. We preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. What a glorious thing to have over the entrance of a church and exactly what that church did. They preached Christ 
crucified. Well, the church had some ivy that was growing up on the outside of the church. And, and over the years, the, the ivy grew. And, and over the years, the leadership changed. And eventually, that ivy covered the very last word, crucified. So all you could read as you came in to the chapel was, we preach Christ. Because ivy covered the crucified part. We preach Christ. Interestingly, what was occurring on the inside of the church was exactly what was happening with the ivy on the outside. The church preached Christ, but now the, now the cross was being left out of the proclamation. Indeed, Christ was being proclaimed, but but now Christ was, Christ was more of a humanitarian. Christ was more of, a, of an example. Christ was more of a, of a moral leader. Interesting, more years went by and the ivy continued to grow. And now all you could read on the outside of the chapel was, we preach, we preach. The Christ and the crucified had been covered up now by the ivy. And so as people came up to the church and said, we preach. And indeed, they, they preached in that chapel. They preached. Proclamation went forward. But now the preaching, it was more, it was more about politics. It's more about who you should vote for. It was more, more personal stories by the preacher. It was more fuzzy little homespun kind of tales. It was more positive thinking. It was more psychological principles to live. More appropriate in a counseling situation. For now it seemed like the services were more of group therapy. What happened was the crux was no longer the crux. Look at verse 2 again. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Beloved, when anything in our lives replaces the crux of Jesus Christ as the most important thing in life, when anything else Becomes the, becomes the crux of our life. That ivy needs to be pulled back. The ivy needs to be pulled back. And God in his grace does just that. Coming in his grace and, and pulling away all of our misplaced priorities and all of the other things that we think. This is what my life is really about. And God just keeps coming in his grace and pulling back that ivy so that what shines is the cross of Jesus Christ to where we understand that we have been placed on this earth and given limited number of breaths for the sole purpose of proclaiming Christ crucified and risen. That we have been given breath to proclaim the gospel. That's the crux of our life. That Jesus Christ on the cross bore all of our sin including all of the cruxes that we put up in our life.
all of the things that we say are the number one things in our life. He bore all of our sin, forgiving us and redeeming us, paying the sin debt we could never, ever pay. Jesus being raised out of the tomb, that declaration that the Father had accepted the sacrifice for sin, that glorious gospel shines then. For that is to be the crux of what it is we are to be about. Proclaiming Jesus cross the empty tomb forgiveness life eternal in the Savior's name this sermon today is the first of four in this little sermon series I've entitled the mission and each and every week we're going to sing the same hymn that was sung before the sermon. It is so rich and so deep. And my prayer is, is that after maybe a week or two, as you're going about your activities, maybe in the store, what's going to be going through your mind is this hymn. It'll just become a part of you. Listen again. So just the verses that Brian sang this morning. There's a call going out across the land in every nation. A call to all who swear allegiance to the cross of Christ. A call to true humility, to live our lives responsibly, to deepen our devotion to the cross at any price. Let us then be sober, moving only in the spirit as aliens and strangers in a hostile foreign land. The message we are preaching is repentance and forgiveness. The author of salvation to the dying race of man. That just breathes scripture, doesn't it? Just breathes it. And week after week here, in these four weeks, I want to unpack together these verses that undergird this great hymn. And in two weeks, in two weeks, I want to share with you an incredibly exciting ministry that's going to emerge through our congregation in 2019. I want to wait two weeks because it's the crescendo of the hymn. I want to show you biblically where all this comes from. Because this ministry in 19, it gets at the heart, right at the heart of who it is that we are to be and who and what it is that we are to be about. So at the end of the day, What's the crux of the matter? The crux is the cross, isn't it? And we have resolved to know nothing among each other than Christ crucified. Nothing else. And we have resolved as a people, as we leave from this place and go into our homes and neighborhoods and workplaces and schools to know nothing else than Christ crucified for the salvation of the world. As you see, the crux is the what? It's the crux, right? The crux is the crux.